Hi there once again and welcome to another Espresso Mechanic tutorial. Now in this one what we're going to be building is what you see on the screen and this is a materialization of a couple of letters obviously that make up the EM of Espresso Mechanic. What I'm doing here is actually using thinking particles and we're using a particle morph to actually create these objects and make them appear on the screen. And then just to add an extra dimension I've also put a couple of traces in there just to make it a little bit more interesting. So that's what we're going to be about in this particular tutorial. Now this is the first part of a two-part series because I am going to be doing a second tutorial just to take things a step further with this. But for this one this is what we're going to be about. So without further ado let's see if we can make this happen. The first thing we need is a text spline so we'll bring one of those into the scene and in the text spline field here we'll just put em now the font i'm going to use will be copper plate so we'll find copper plate and just bring that in it's just down here somewhere there we go copper plate that's fine and we'll leave everything set up as it is that's that's perfectly good the only thing i'm going to do is use separate letters and then all I need to do from here is hit C to make this editable and remove both of these splines from there for now. Okay, that's great. So these two, I'm going to rename them. I'm going to say they're E base and M base. And then all I'm going to do is copy them and rename these. E target and M target. Okay, fantastic. And these two here, of course, can be placed into a extrude object. So I'm going to hold down my option key and they will both get their extrude objects. Now we'll leave those as they are for the moment. I think we can just worry about those a bit later. I won't want them as deep as that, but I'm going to control the actual depth of the offset here. I'm going to control that using keyframes, but I'll, I'll just set it to 10 for now, I think, just as a starting point. OK, and we'll also put some caps rounding on here as well, just a centimetre of that or possibly a little bit more, but I think a centimetre will probably be OK. Another thing we need to do is select both of these splines and at the moment their type is Bezier. I want them to be linear and the same with these two, just make them linear. We'll leave the adaptive for the intermediate points, that's fine. Okay, so that's our splines set up. The only thing I will do for now is just switch off the two extrudes. I'll leave those switched off. The next thing we need to do is actually ascertain how many points these splines have because that's going to be important to us. So we'll bring up the structure manager and we'll start taking a look at what we've got. So we can use the E target and the M target because obviously they're both the same as the base splines. So if we select the E target, we can see that we have 36 points because starting from naught we end at 35 so 36 is going to be an important number to us and with the M it's 30, 39 here so we've got 40 points with the M so 36 and 40 those numbers are going to be important so make a note of them because these are going to be the actual number of thinking particles that we're going to need to control the actual shape of each of our letters so that's great we've got that worked out Moving on from here, we can start thinking about creating the Espresso expression that's going to control all of this. So that will be our next port of call. Let's bring in a null, rename it Espresso, and give it the Espresso tag. Fantastic. So we've got our window open. It's a little bit large at the moment, so we'll make it a bit smaller. Though it will eventually get quite large because the expression does feature quite a number of nodes on this occasion. The first thing to actually do is bring in the Espresso Null and at the output stage give it a global position port and also a global matrix port. Okay, so that's 
got that in. Now the next thing to do is bring in a pstorm node. And we'll bring one of those in from our thinking particles and it'll be a generator pstorm. So we've got one of those. We've got a position port at the input stage and we'll also add an alignment port and then we can connect our global position to the emitter position and the global matrix to the emitter alignment and we can then move our emitter around. But we'll for now pull this back over here and it wants to be somewhere behind the E. Let's just go into our top view so F2 just to see where this is with regard to our letter E, so our E is here and our espresso is here. We could probably just bring it over so that it's somewhere near the middle of the E, which is here. So th this will do quite nicely, I think. So let's just go back or just play forward a little bit. And we can see now that we've got our emitter here and it will emit particles if we just play the timeline. It's facing in the wrong direction, but that doesn't really matter. We can easily remedy that. We can turn this through 180 degrees if we grab a hold of this, hold down shift, and just rotate that through 180 degrees. And now it is facing in the right direction. I don't think it matters too much with that because we are going to be, be creating a particle morph, but uh, we might as well do things correctly and get it set up the way we perhaps like it to be facing. The next thing we can add is an on port to our P storm at the input stage and at the output stage we want a particle birth output so we've got that set up as it needs to be. Moving on from here we need to bring in a P group so from our thinking particles standard menu here we can bring in a P group and at the moment it's got all in there and we can connect this to the particle birth. We'll do that in a little while. But first we need to actually set up two different groups. So in our simulate menu here we can come down to thinking particles settings and with the all here if we just hold down in my case on, our, on a Mac the control key I can add a group and then I can do the same again just add a second group. We'll rename these. I'll simply call this one E, this one M, and then we'll work with the colors. So the E group, I'm sim or the, the 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 M. Well, this is the M group is selected. Let's just select the E group first. So with the E group selected, I'm going to change the color to a yellow. And then for the M, I'll make it green. So somewhere there is fine. So we've got those two set up and they're ready to go. The next thing we can do is actually drag this E and place it in our group here. So we're dealing with our E group, first of all. So let's just plumb that in to the P-Storm. So they're set up and they're ready to go for to our next stage. And that's to bring in a time node. So we'll bring one of those in. It does need a time port because we will be using a monoflop so we'll leave that there but we also need a frame port and we'll put the frame port at the top. So those two ports are all we need for our time node. Moving on from here we can think about what we're going to do next. Now we need to set up a p-pass before we go much further because we've got an element of this that we need to set up before we really start to go for it. But we'll bring in the p-pass. So let's just go to thinking particles, p-pass from the initiator menu. And again, with the p-pass, we don't want the group to be all. We want it to be the E group, so let's just get that from our settings and we just drag that in from here. So we've got our E group in there. Okay, fantastic. So now we can think about actually setting up the structure that's going to allow us to actually create a morph. 
that's going to be our next port of call. The first thing we need to do to get things moving is to set up our P storm. The type will be a circle. The birth type though needs to be set to shot. Now this shot value, it needs to match up with the number of, of points that we've got in the E. And we said earlier that we would have 36 points in the E. So we need the shot value to be 36. So let's set that up. 36 and the lifespan I'm going to make 300. I will make the life variation zero. That's fine. The speed needs to be zero too. The speed variation can be zero. The size can be one. It doesn't really matter what the value is there. Once again, the size variation can be zero. The X FOV zero degrees and the same with the Y and everything else can be left as it is because we don't need to do any work in there. OK, that's great. So we've got things set up that far. Now let's bring in a condition node. Or rather, I shouldn't say a compare node, beg your pardon. Let's just bring one of those in. Was it compare node? That's what we want. And we can connect the frame output port from the time node to the input one of the compare. Now the function needs to be equal to one. So when we're equal to one, we want something to happen. And that is to switch on the P storm. Because we don't want particles to be generated at any other time apart from when we're at frame one. And we can see that we've got some. And there are 36 particles now generated. So that's our starting positions. These, these all represent our starting positions for the points of our baseline here, which is at the moment over here. So what's going to happen is that these, these will literally, it will grab a hold of every one of those points and bring this spline over here. So we'll end up with a random sort of grungy type spline. And that's exactly what I want. That's going to be what we're ultimately doing. Okay, so we've got it that far. And now we can think about the next step. Before we do take the next step, it's also worth showing you if we go into our simulate menu, thinking particles settings, if we just step forward one frame, we can see that these particles are all yellow. So they are particles that belong to the E group. So we, we can see that that's all set up and working as it should. Just to illustrate that point, fantastic. Right, let's move on to the next step. Well, we can command drag to grab another compare node and once again, plumb the frame into the input one. Now this compare needs to be set up with a function greater than. So greater than one frame. We want something else to happen. So we've generated our particles at frame one. And now when we're greater than one, we want something to happen. Well, we need a monoflop. So we'll grab one of those. And it needs to be a one shot monoflop. So when it receives a one at the trigger input, then it's going to trigger it and make it work. So once we've once we're greater than one, we are indeed going to produce a one at the output here. And that's going to trigger the monoflop at that time. The next thing to do is plumb the time port into or the time output port from the time node into the time input port of the monoflop. We need to do that next so we can get that plumbed in there. And our duration we can set to 30 frames. At the output, we also need a state. So we've got that set up and that's going to generate a value between zero and one over 30 frames. That's what we needed to do. Fantastic. So we're, we've got it to that stage and we can worry about what we're going to do now with our P pass and then bring in some range mappers and various other nodes in order to make our morph work. So that's going to be our next step. The first node that we'll need to bring in is a P get data node. So we'll bring in one of those from our helper menu here. We've got a P get data. Bring that in here and we can plumb our P pass output into the particle input. At the output stage, we need a position port. So we've got that ready. We'll just make this window a little bit bigger once again. Now moving on from here, we can think about what we're going to be doing with this P get data. We need to bring in 
our base spline and we'll also bring in our e-target spline get those two positioned over here and they're ready for the next step which is to give them both output or rather object ports at the output stage so those are ready now we'll bring in a point node and place this one over here we can plumb in the object port into the object input port here on the point node and our index port we can take that from our P pass so we'll add an index port here and we'll also hold down the control key click on the actual pane here and then in our ports we can show names this will make life a bit easier for us so we've got our index port and we can plumb this in here so now we're cycling through the actual points of our eBay spline the last port that we need to add is a point position at the input stage we'll place it at the top just double click with the command key held down to make the window or the, or the node I should say its maximum size and then we can grab a hold of our position output from the pget data and plumb it into the point position of the point node now at the moment we're not seeing any change but let's step forward one frame and now we can see that the base spline here is now a tangle of vectors connected to the points here to connect it to each of our particles and that's exactly what I need to have so that's what we're starting with okay that's our starting point of our morph and we've got to then morph between this state to this finished state over here okay so that's what we need to set up next for a start we can get another point node so we'll bring in one of those now on this occasion we don't need any position port we don't need to worry about that because we're more interested in taking the position from the output port here but we can plumb the object output port of our e-target here into the object input port get that done for a start and then once again we're going to use the point index we're going to take that from the, the p pass and sequence through those so these are being sequenced at the same time they're going to be synchronized and that's very important okay so we've got that done let's just move these over here a little bit just to tidy things up okay so where do we need to go next well the next port of call is actually to bring in two vector to reals adapters so vector to reals we want one of those and command drag to copy to get a second one now our first vector to reals we can connect the position from our get data node to the input and on this occasion with the second one we need to connect the point position from our point node to here so we're interested in getting if we just view that at 100% once again we're interested in getting the positions of our particles and also the positions of our points from our target spline that's what we're interested in because they are our start and end states and we said that we need to morph between them so that's what we're doing here so this is our start state this is our end state so we've got those two here now the next thing to do is bring in three range mappers so we'll come down to calculate range mapper bring in the first one command drag to copy and command drag to copy again so that we've got three of them now the first thing we can do with our monoflop here we can actually plumb the state output port into the inputs of all three of them because this is going to drive all three range mappers okay and then our first range mapper here will be our x values and then the second will be our y's and the third our z's so we're generating three types of real data 
from breaking down our vectors here and we're going to be using them in the way that I've just described. Now let's just sort this out. So the next thing to do then is to add some ports at the input stages of each of these. So we need output lower and output upper and we can think about how we're going to wire this up. So our output lower will be our start state. So we need to plumb this X value into here and then our, our destination, our target state is what we need next. So we can we can plumb this into there. So that gives us our first range mapper set up. Our second ma range mapper, we've just got to repeat the process, but with this time using the Y output here. So this one's going to plumb into here and this one into here. And then finally, it's the Z's. So we'll set this up, plumb our Z from here into here and from this one into this one. And that gets our range mappers completely set up and they're ready to go. Our next step is to bring in another adapter and this time we need a reels to vector. But we only need one because we can plumb all of these in accordingly. So here, here and here. And now that part of the actual setup is ready to go. Fantastic. Let's just hit H so that we can see everything. Great. So what do we need to do next? Well, the next thing we need to do is bring in a set data node, a P set data. So from our standard menu, we can come down to here, P set data, bring this in. And we also need to give it a position port at the input stage as well as a particle port. The particle port we can take from the output of the p-pass and plumb this into the particle input port here. Just move over a little bit, just bring it in here. And then this output from the reels to vector can be plumbed into the position port. Okay, so if everything is connected correctly and all things being fair, we should now be able to get a morph going. So let's just see what happens. If we just take this back to zero. Don't worry about seeing the spline. I'll deal with that a little bit later. But let's see if anything happens. And straight away we can see that it does. The spline starts here and then leaps across the screen and we get the, the actual particles at the points on our target spline and our base spline has moved to that position. If we hide the E target, if we just make that disappear, we can see that our base spline is now where our target spline previously was. If we just go back and do that again, we can just run and we should be able to make this work. If we just go that, do this again, can we? We should be able to, let's just bring that back. That's interesting, it's not doing it now. Why is that not doing that? Have I missed something somewhere? That's really weird because that worked perfectly the first time. It should work. It definitely should. I'll do a double check on it and, and see what's going on. No, that's odd. I'll tell you what, I'll do a check on that and then come back to you. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's the monoflop. If we grab a hold of a result node, plumb this into the output, and then we try again. Let's see what happens now. We go back to zero run this and straight away there you go it works and if we go back to zero we can get it working again and again yeah it's just the monoflop it's misbehaving as it so often does you just need this extra step i don't know why that is i, I do wish they'd sort it out but it's it's just this monoflop but there you go uh that's that's fixed it so just leave a result on the end of there if you get that problem and you probably will but that's that part of the algorithm completely sorted out now there's a couple more things we need to do. Essentially, we need two more compare nodes. So we'll grab a hold of all of these nodes and move them up here a little way. Just move it out of the way. Just move that one as well. So let's get a couple more compares in. I'll just bring these, I think, tighter to there. 
and then we can just drop our compares in. So we'll bring one in here for a start and plumb the frame value in. Now this one needs to be, let's have a look, where are we? Yeah, this needs to be, the function needs to be equal to and it needs to be zero in the input two. So when we're at frame zero, what we need to do, we just need to bring in the eBase spline. So we'll bring that in. And in the basic properties, we'll say viewport visibility. We'll also do render a visibility because if you do want to render this out, you're going to need the both of them. And we'll just connect this accordingly. OK, so that's that done. Let's see where we are. If we go back to zero, now we can see that the spline is no longer visible. That's the first thing I needed to sort out. So let's just see what happens. Yep, we're OK there. Go back to zero. We can't see the spline. That's fine. We can actually lose the E target now because we don't need to see that anymore. So there we go. That's there. That's all right. That's OK. Should be working as it needs to. It does flash up there. I don't quite know why that is. It shouldn't really do that, but uh, but there you go. I mean, it is switched off at zero. And what are we getting there? That's interesting. We got a yeah. It might be a, a might be a bit of an anomaly going on there. But it looks generally okay. I think it. I think it is okay. But uh, but yeah, there's a bit of an anomaly there. But it it is it is working okay that's gone some of the way to sorting out our problem and the spline is now invisible at frame zero now where are we we also need another compare in there and this one's going to be used to drive a gravity because what i'm going to do is actually move when we if we just play this through i'm going to start moving this along its z-axis in the minus direction after it's materialized. So that's the, the next thing we need to worry about. So if we bring in, let's just move this out of the way, just bring in another compare and I'll drop it under this one, wire the frame port into the input. Now this one needs to be, let's have a look, where are we? We need to be greater than 30. So greater than for the function and 30. So after we've hit 30 frames, we can start thinking about moving. So if we bring in a P gravity, so where are we thinking particles? We need a dynamic P gravity, bring that in there. And we need to switch this on via the compare. So again, what I'll do is hold down my control key and show names for the ports take the on and just put it at the top take my output from my compare and plumb that into the on input there so that's going to switch the gravity on at the correct time and then the particle can be taken once again from this p pass and we can just plumb that in there so let's just see what happens now we run the timeline do we get anything? No, we don't. And the reason for that is because our gravity here actually needs a gravity object. So what we'll do is bring one of those in. And now call it gravity. And if we reselect the gravity node and drop this into the object field, we should find that we've now got a, a gravity object and we have at the moment it's not facing in the right direction we need to turn it through 180 degrees so again if we get a hold of it and just hold down the shift key we can rotate through 180 degrees and now if we play we should find that the E starts to move and that's exactly what we need to happen fantastic Another thing we need to do with the Espresso, we actually need to change the priority. We need to make that generators and we'll put it to minus one. So let's see what we get now. And now that's actually solved our problem, I think. So let's have a look. 
yeah that because we did have a little bit of an issue the particles were actually slightly ahead of the e when it was moving and now they're tied to it you can see that they're actually both synchronized and that's important to us and there we go that's looking really nice great that's looking really good and there we go that's floating off into the distance and I mean you, you can control how fast you want that to move I mean if you don't want it to move quite as fast as that you can just change the uh, the value of the strength in the gravity we can make that say 50 and it will be slower let's see what happens now yeah and it's it's half the speed now that's probably more like it actually so that's our first expression well and truly complete now in order to get the m working all we've got to do is copy this expression and if we just copy that down there we can go into here now the next thing to do is start working with the m group so if we go into our tp settings we've got our m group we can bring that into here and we can also bring it into our p pass so we'll grab a hold of our p pass here we'll just select it here and then we can simply grab a hold of the m and drop it in here into the group so that's done that and then we've also got to set up our splines so we can work with these here so we've got the m base we can bring that one into here and we've got the m target and that can drop in to there so that's done that if we just have a quick check see if anything's working yeah we can see that they both are that's doing its job now so we've got that working the next thing that we need to do is probably think about creating or rather moving I should say because we've got two nulls we've got espresso one but they're both occupying the same position if we move espresso one we can actually get that set up somewhere over here so that it's just behind the M that looks about right and let's see what happens now if we just run this yeah that's better so they're both starting from correct positions now so that, and they're both doing the job the only thing is they're both triggering at exactly the same time and we don't want that so we need to do a little bit of work with our espresso again let's just see what we can do for a start we want our monoflop to be triggered at a different time we don't want that to be triggered at exactly the same time as the first one so what we'll do is say greater than and it will be 15 so we want 15 frames to pass before our M is triggered and then with our what else have we got here let's have a look our gravity so the one that's controlling the gravity we want that to be greater than 60 that gives us a one second delay the P storm we can trigger that at 15 so we'll say equal to 15 and then the compare we can leave or rather actually the, the compare here we can make this less than 15 that will work fine if we just make that less than 15 that's what we need right so let's go back to the beginning and see what we get now so then neither of them are there that's good so just get rid of the target spline I think get rid of that M target if we can let's see where we are right okay that's interesting why have I got a point that's there let's have a look ah I know why I know why because we said in our P storm we needed 40 for our second spline so we've got 40 there now let's see what we get now yeah there we go that's working that's working as it as it needs to right let's have a look and see where we are we've also got to do something to sort this out I think less than 15 should switch the M off but it isn't 
say equal to zero. Does that look? Interestingly, it's not. I don't quite know what's going on there. Less than 15 should definitely work. It did when I set this up before, but I don't quite understand why it isn't now. Ah, yes, I do. Yes, I do. It's because we've got to put M base in there. And now it will work. Just the last thing I needed to set up. And there you go. That's working. And now they're both doing exactly what I want them to do. So that's all good. OK. Right, we're getting the result that we want. That's fine. Fabulous. Now, the last parts of this we just need to set up. We need to put a, a couple of tracers in for a start. We'll get those in. So I'm going to bring from here. We need, we need a couple of tracers. So I'll bring the first one in and the second one in. And all we've got to do in order to make these work is just basically give them the groups they need to be placed into the group into the trace link. We don't want Expresso one. If we've got anything in there, we don't want that. We want if we go into our simulate menu once again, TP settings. We just simply need to bring these groups into here. So grab hold of the E, drop that in there. And in tracer number two, grab hold of the M and drop that in there. And then with both of them selected, we can set them up. So we're going to use with the limit from end and we'll say 10. We don't need TP subgroups. We don't need to worry about that, but we can leave that as it is. I think that should be fine. So let's just see what we get. I think the spline, though, what I probably will set that up as is, is cubic so that we get a more interesting result. OK, let's see what happens now. So straight away, you can see we're getting a nice result. And as they start to go, we get tails left behind them. That's exactly what I want from there. So that's all really looking nice. Yeah, that looks great. It, it just sort of enhances the materialization, which is nice. So we'll just make that gravity disappear, actually. Just hide that. But yeah, so I'm pleased with that so far. That's that's looking quite nice. The only thing we need to do now then is switch on these two extrudes. So we'll switch those both on and let's just see what happens when we go back to the beginning. We can see that they do materialize really quite nicely, but the extrudes are being left there, of course, because we need to switch those off at the right times. But that's fine. We can easily do that. So in our Espresso, what we can do is simply rather than saying e base what we'll do is actually drag in the extrudes and i'm going to call this extrude e and this one m so if we drag this one into here and with our second expression we can drag this one into here and now they're both switched off let's just see what happens when we run this the timeline so we're getting them both firing through Okay, let's have a quick look, see what we've got. Let's go back to the beginning. I don't know why we're getting that flash. I, di I didn't get that before. I don't know quite what's going on there. I'll have to do some checks and see what's going on. But we are getting essentially what we want. It's just that there's a flash at the beginning, which there shouldn't be. Now, the other thing that we've got to do is set up the actual way these are going to work. And I did that with keyframes. So if we just close the Espresso down, we can actually bring in some keyframes to actually control when the, if we go into our object, when the offset actually grows. So what we want with the first one, with the E here, at zero or a frame zero, we can switch this off completely so that it's, it's just a zero offset. So it's just going to be a flat object. If we then go through to 30 frames we can set this to 20 and we can record there we can also do the same thing if we switch the caps here the size we can make that zero when we're at the start of the animation and when we get to 30 
we can make it one and record that there so let's see what we get now so we can see that we're getting that growth that's that's doing its job so that's okay we can do the same with the m but what we want to do with the m we will want to record the offset at zero we'll leave it at zero there move through to 15 frames and record at zero again and then when we get to 45 frames at this point we can make the offset 10 or other 20 and record again once again go back to frame 15 or frame zero actually and we'll record our caps at zero 15 frames keep that at zero and then at 45 frames send that to one and record and we're getting them set up as we want them set up okay it's just that flash problem that I'm getting there that I don't like and I don't quite understand why that is because I wasn't getting it when I did my original version of this I'm going to run a few checks and then I'll see if I can find out what's going on there and then come back to you okay it transpires that having looked at this what we need to do in this compare here we've got it as equal to one it doesn't like it being equal to one it wants it to be equal to zero now I find this odd because as I said everything worked when I did it in my original it was all fine but there you go the only thing I will say is that in the interim between making the original and making this tutorial I did actually upgrade my computer's operating system and I wonder if that could be the problem I doubt it but who knows maybe it could be the problem but anyway let's move on from here so we've changed this compare here the one that controls the P storm the on for the P storm so that's the one you need to change change that from equal to one to equal to zero so that's the first thing and then we need to work in our second expression here and in this one we need to work with the compare that's controlling the visibility of our letter M and that needs to be less than or equal to as opposed to less than 15 so we've done those two let's see what difference that has made so let's run the sequence at the moment we're not quite getting what we want let's just rewind and run that but now you can see that we're not getting that we're not getting that flashing so that particular glitch has now been resolved as I say completely bizarre I don't know why that's happening but there you go we've we've solved the problem the only thing we can say though it's still a little bit ugly if you look at the materialization there's still a bit of a sort of, of a glitch in it isn't there it's a little bit ugly in the way that that's materializing now we can fix that really easily and I'll show you how to do that if we start by sorting out the expression that controls our letter E now in the P storm up here we've got a random seed value now if you do get a bit of an ugly materialization play around with this value uh, and you'll find a sweet spot that will work now if I change this to 12304 I found that was good in this particular instance and if we then go into our second expression select our P storm in here and change this seed value here we change this to 12348 now let's see what happens now if we just play the sequence are we getting a better result actually I think we'll just play that again because I'm sure this buffers before it actually sorts itself out and we can see now we're not it's it's much cleaner that's cleaner it looks nicer it's much smoother yeah much much smoother and much more pleasing on the eye so you can see that that works really nicely so that's what you need to do if you get that ugly sort of materialization just play around with your seed values in here until you get a sweet spot okay that's all you need to do so we've solved 
all of our problems and everything is now working the way we want it to. I'm just going to reduce the frames down to 200 because 500 is a bit too many. But we just let this run while I talk. So yeah, everything at the moment is working exactly as I want it to work. So that essentially brings us to the end of this first tutorial. But before I go, I'm just going to show you what I'm going to do in the second tutorial and what I'm going to be actually showing you how to do in there. So in our second tutorial, we're going to be creating this. It's a paint type effect that I've created. Now, much of the Espresso is actually the same, but just with a few more nodes. And another thing that we're also going to be using will be matrix objects. So I'm going to be generating the initial particles on matrix objects just to show you how to do this. You don't necessarily have to, but I wanted to get this in because it's important to show you this stuff. And then we've also got some random effectors as well. So it's a little bit different and a little bit more involved. And there is also user data, which I've got up here in a controller. So I can control basically which splines are fed where into the expression. You'll see how we do that. And I've also got gravity controls here so that this can be art directed and we can control which letter actually moves at which time, really. I mean, we can control the speed at which they move, basically. I mean, I've got the P running faster than the, the S there and you can see the way it's working and the T is going to overtake the A. So that's in the gravity settings here. That's how I've done that kind of stuff. OK, so that's what we're going to be looking at for next time. So be sure to tune in because this is going to be a lot of fun and I think you'll find it quite interesting. And that just about brings us to the end of this tutorial. And as always, I really hope you've enjoyed doing this one and that it's given you some ideas for things that you can perhaps incorporate into your own projects. And if you have enjoyed the video, then please give it a like. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel, leave a comment and of course, ring the bell. And wherever you happen to be on social media, please, please do share this video because all this good stuff really does help keep the channel moving in the right direction. But anyway, that about wraps this one up. So I'll see you very soon in part two.